Oh man, uh, this recording is going to be slightly oddly placed. Um, I'm going to have to quickly upload my like, I think I'm going to trim it down to like six hours. I've got six hours of esoteric psychology, which is really a terrible thing to, to try to, to wade through. Um, uh, but me just talking about Metagram and how I see Metagram in its current structure. But um, without getting into the quagmire of my um, research, uh, I was having a discussion with Black Wolf recently, um, you know, from his kind of more uh, black pull, red pull, you know, kind of perspective and experience, uh, which, you know, I'm not very active in any community. I just see things from the outside and I analyze themes and, and, and stuff like that. But, um, I, I wanted to talk about, uh, the kind of the, the sex in politics, because, uh, there was a thing that he brought up about, you know, how, you know, and, and, and a lot of people have commented about this, you know, the general sexual dysfunction, the, the general distortion, you know, the kind of the high, it's, and I mean, I would relate it to the kind of hypersexuality, which you see in cluster B personality type ordered individuals, especially borderlines, the hypersexual component of that, um, which I think is, is understood from the same things uh, when I was listening to, uh, Oh my word, I think I might be getting his name wrong. I, I need to look it back up on on Discord. Is is it uh, Hal Doe, I think is his name, um, in the Tea House Discord where they have a psychological club and he gave this wonderful presentation on dysfunctional families. Um, and and he talked about, you know, sort of the the main sort of constituents of these things and how they share these great psychological thematic sort of elements and the devouring mother, the Oedipal mother, um, and the anima possessed father have this kind of unholy alliance as it were. But, um, anyway, the, uh, without, um, doing justice to that presentation, but just talking about the, I, I, I wanted, I, I think I've got a model of, I think I've got a, an overarching model that explains this phenomena and this kind of dovetails, or this is a continuation of right at the end of my six hours of esoteric psychology, I was speculating as to the differences between masculine and feminine psychology, that there are, that there is a kind of thematic difference. Um, and it, it really has to do with which basic connection between certain sides of the mind are, are prioritized between the genders on, on, in, in, in general, you know, as a kind of, as a stereotype, but also as a, as a general, uh, as a generalization. And that what the kind of the, the, psychological style which could be seen as feminine and uh, and I was talking about how and I, I I want to revise this now because I think I think what I said there's some truth in it uh, what I ended up saying was that the emergent response and the primary counter offer which are the emotional tone self images which are the predicate of um, in the emergent response, it's the ego, and in the primary counter offer, it's the unconscious side of the mind, but also the super ego. But that's also complex because the, the super ego uses that emotional tone, the primary counter offer, as a front, as a mask. But there's something else going on behind it, which doesn't fall into metagram circuitry, it doesn't fall into the false ego complex. Um, because the soupy ego, as far as I can see, is almost like the, the primordial soup out of which the false ego complex uh, emerges from. But 
yeah, so it, it's strange because the the primary counter offer is like a front man. It's kind of like the the Wizard of Oz, um, and the man behind the curtain. You only see the Wizard of Oz. You don't see the man behind the curtain. That's sort of what the primary counter offer is. And I think that the 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 emergent response in the primary counter offer. This goes off the um, the assumption that within my model of metagram circuitry in, within the pathways, the lines of connection within the field circuits, which are made up of two emotional tones or, or two cognitive inflections, which are both made up of the same two, co the two ingredients of cognitive functions that they are linking, but the one cognitive function, um, sorry, the, the one emotional tone uh, I call it like a negative emotional tone because it negates the other cognitive function. And the other one is a, I called it a positive emotional tone because it makes that, that as, as juxtaposed to the first emotional tone, um, the second emotional tone that's positive, instead of negating the second cognitive function, it actually has a stronger expression of that second cognitive function. So these two cognitive functions on the same line, the one sort of denotes stagnation or holding charge or breaking down the flow, whereas the positive one overcharges the next cognitive function and allow and, and makes the room for that to convert that overcharge, that positive charge into either stagnation or moving the charge yet forward once again. So it either you know, it makes room for fluid. So the positive charges make room for, you could call it circulation. And the, and the stagnant charges or the negative charges are kind of like um, flags, raised flags, or, or kind of like um, uh, uh, embattled defensive coping mechanisms or, or whatever. And the primary counter offer and the emergent response are always are always both. They're, one is positive and one is negative. So one will always feed the other and it creates a kind of loop. So between the unconscious side of the mind uh, and which is the other, or which, uh, which is also perhaps uh, the, this emotional tone is the same as the superego's emotional tone, um, although it's only one half of the story of the superego, And the ego are kind of like an Ouroboros. They're eating their own tail. And they're kind of... Now, there are exceptions to this, but I'm not going to talk about the, those exceptions. They're very rare personality styles that have um, double circuits. And they actually have... Uh, and they can cause problems for themselves. I think this is also what, what generates bipolar, is that you end up generating, when you have an alternative emergent response, you end up generating um, a virtual primary counter offer. And when you have a virtual primary counter offer, you can debase your own superego. You, you can sort of um, constellate around a separate organizing principle which is what the unconscious side of the the stability of the unconscious side of the mind is the thing that contributes mostly i would say to the persistence of identity or at least the the negation of identity dysregulation kind of stuff but anyway um what i think now is feminine i i said my my my, my conjecture was is that the feminine style is that the emergent response and the and the primary counter offer, which are basically ordinarily found on the same line, are feed, uh, have to work out some kind of symbiosis, some kind of power sharing arrangement, and they are engaged in this kind of circular drama within their particular field circuit. So they have to kind of colonize the other pathways in the same field circuit to somehow satisfy both of them, and they're sort of fundamentally. You know, they have a kind of bipolar charge. They have a kind of... So how they work out some kind of power-sharing compromise is something that I think women are more focused on achieving, whereas the stimulus, which is the, um, the emotional tone that is the predicate of the subconscious, which is um, 
the new creation within the false ego complex and has a kind of independent accounting system is found somewhere else. Uh, it's, it may be in some, I, have, I haven't gone through this clerically, um, uh, to, 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 to do the secretarial work uh, to, to, to double check this, but I think that some stimuluses might be in the same field circuit, but um, it might be a very rare uh, subset of, of personality styles that have that, but I think the vast majority is, is that the stimulus is going to be in another field circuit. And the stimulus then and the primary counter offer and the emergent response are going to be apart from one another. And they are going to sort of, the emergent response and the primary counter offer is going to create a kind of magnetic matrix or a kind of you know, it, it's, it's going to create a, a field, a wave, you know, like a wave pool. It's going, the, the activity of that field circuit is going to corral the possibilities of how the subconscious stimulus relates to this already existing sort of diode. And I think that the masculine and this is what I conjectured, is that the masculine is all about the focus of how the subconscious connects with the ego. And then you've got a kind of, you've got a specialization of psychological work where women are masters of how the emergent response balances with the primary counter offer and men are masters of how the stimulus finds its way strewn across, you know, sort of, different part you know the, the length of of different you know like how does the the stimulus correspond by distance over distance into connecting and integrating with either the primary counter offer or the emergent response and when you connect with one and not the other it's very lopsided especially because you know if you're just feeding the ego and you're not feeding anywhere now my other remark is is that what the uh, what the Oedipal mother is what what the you know the the um uh uh you know the the the, the devouring mother and uh and there's anyway I'll I'll talk about narcissism later on because I think narcissism is the other side of this um what the Oedipal mother effectively does is that it locks down the field circuit that their emergent response and primary counter offer exist within. They don't take on outside intrusion of it. They don't allow the communication of content from anything else in that field circuit. So they are unilater unilaterally dictating the internal balance. In some sense, they have created that field circuit as an objective truth. They don't have a distinction between the self and the collective. They don't have a a distinction between the individual internal locus and the external locus of control. They have conflated this into a solitary model. And that is how they organize their own psychology in some senses by broadcasting it, is by sort of emitting it um, and controlling it for the group. And this involves obviously social manipulation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and and bad reality checks, but also, you know, sort of creating reality tunnels and trying to sort of promulgate reality by unilateral, unilaterally dictating it. Now, that I think is the kind of the borderline tendency. And it has its own defense mechanism that when the strategy fails, then what it does is it kind of recedes into its own satellite stimulus, which has never been integrated with its own kind of um, cordoned off dictatorial field circuit and it actually completely recedes from the field circuit and it says okay well then you you manage the field circuit you unilaterally dictate what's in the field circuit and I'll just ride your coattails until I berate you as having failed for being the dictator of the field circuit because they they believe that the, they've they've set up that field circuit as being one of a kind of 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 a of a of a winner takes all of a of a total supreme authoritarian dictator of, of a kind of tyranny and 
this this treatment of that field circuit which is itself a kind of delusion but it, it is a kind of coping me mechanism to some degree as well um, But, you know, you could also see it as something also uh, archetypally, you could see it as like the, the, the Lord of the Rings, you know, in terms of the one ring to rule them all, that they need there to be a psychological instrument that is the one ring to rule them all. Uh, if you also want to extend the, the metaphor from the one ring to, to the ideology of fascism and its, and its kind of psychological roots of invisibility, um, the invisibility of the individual accountability, and you just become part of, you become invisible to the environment, you are camouflaged by the conditioning of the system. Um, you become the hidden hand in the system, um, and you have a kind of full purview over it. But, uh, okay, sorry, I'm, um, let me focus back in on my point. Um, so, I think that the, the Oedipal mother is setting up an introjective paradigm, an ideal paradigm, and they are the interpreter of the reality of that field circuit. They are the sole subjective relativistic um, percipient. They are the they are the solipsistic. Um, regent of seeing what what is happening in that field circuit nobody else can have input can communicate about it that, that that there is no duplication of that field circuit in that other people can't have a different version of that field circuit they, this field circuit is an objective reality is an external narrative and there's only one of them there's only one field there's only one environment it doesn't other people can't contend their own separate instance of that model so it's this kind of this this conflation of reality in relation to this field circuit now and this is this is fundamentally toxic to the masculine drive to integrate through field circuits through pathways to reach their own emergent response and so i think that when people have become narcissist because of the trauma that they've received in growing up to some degree is and and i don't want to be because not all narcissists grow from this kind of trauma i think that um this can also be a kind of learned helplessness as well but anyway i'm uh, that essentially the narcissist wants there to be a kind of oedipal mother and in fact i think that the narcissist has a kind of that this is the dead mother that they imprint in, uh, on in themselves can also be a kind of psychological device that they have imprinted on without having the kind of trauma of a dead mother. But anyway, that, that's, let me not harp on that tangent. It's not that important. Um, but the idea that you can have a kind of environmentally mediated Oedipal mother that controls an objective field circuit means that there's a kind of political game that can be played, a kind of social manipulation, a social politics, in which you don't have to get to grips with this field circuit. You can get other people to get to grips with it, and therefore you don't have to balance your own integration. You, 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 you don't have to reach the 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 existential curse of the the absurdity that the false ego complex and using energy in this way using emotional tones in this way is a fundamentally sort of um you know sort of circular monotony that it kind of reaches some you know so i i do think that there is a breed of narcissism that perhaps already sees the end of the false ego complex and instead wishes to drag it out, wishes to prolong the delusion or the indulgence in it because everybody else is is doing some version of this and I don't want to, you know, so I, I do think that there is perhaps a kind of, there is something in, in narcissists that have perhaps seen the truth and they don't want to um, 
go through the ardor, the, the arduous uh, developmental line of growth and maturity, and uh, because they kind of they've got a preemptive cynicism which keeps them in this kind of coping mechanism as well. So I do think that there's, there is perhaps a bad faith element in, in, in there. Anyway, I mean, I think there are lots of psychopathologies that have a kind of an, un, an unaware element and, and a bad faith element, uh, you know, within a kind of spectrum of, of, um, of self-imposed um, Uh, stagnation but but anyway um, let me not harp on that tangent um, now now the thing that I want to clean up is that I don't actually think that the feminine necessarily is the emergent response and primary counter offer balancing I think that it might actually be just the balancing of the unconscious side of the mind and the superego so it might literally just be the balancing of the one emotional tone with the thing that is behind that emotional tone that isn't an emotional tone, but that uses that emotional tone as a disguise. And that even displaces the development of the ego. So the emergent response is a beleaguered puppet of the dialogue between the unconscious side of the mind and the superego. And so you kind of have a unipole power of identity. And because of this unipolar dialogue, which is a kind of solipsistic dialogue as well, that negates the, the input of other people, because it, it's, um, it can't... I think it's, it's this structural unipole weakness as to why it can't iterate that field circuit into other people having other readings of the same field circuit. They can't, they can't admit other people having communication or input over that. So they have to fight over this authoritarian dictatorial narrative. And they simply don't care um, that other people aren't on their same page, as it were. So I think that that that's actually what's happening, which is not so far from what I was saying, but it is a bit of an adaptation, but anyway. And then their own ego is a slave to this unipole of the unconscious side of the mind, or the unconscious superego. And in some sense, it's all just a kind of, even the unconscious is just a kind of, is being pushed by this kind of, I mean, I call this the kind of the chess playing demon, I, and I think that this is what it is. And... The thing, though, that makes it seem so utterly bad faith to me is that their stimulus, I think, is on the same page. Their stimulus is uh, their their subconscious is egging this on. It's not like their their stimulus just goes with the flow. And this is also why they need a kind of, they need a beta male, they need a white knight, or they need a butler, that they need a pseudo-intellectual cerebral histrionic that will run the, that will massage the reality, the, the disfigurement and the twisting and the contortion and the backflipping and the incoherence. They need something to absorb the dissonance of this brittle structure that essentially and so they need somebody else to come in and adopt their stimulus to 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 be the switchboard operator and and but to be the switchboard operator not of helping them have connections within themselves but to be the vicarious switchboard operator um and and that's the kind of cerebral histrionic and the cerebral histrionic now, this is how I think it happens on the scale of individual psychology. Obviously, there are versions of this where people are doing this on a collective level, that I think that the Oedipal mother can also have an ideological valence, an organizing kind of principle, as it were, and that this 
Yeah, and, and so we, we are sitting with the residue of these kinds of corruptions. We are sitting and, and, it, you know, and they come bundled in you know, sort of semantic confusion. They come bundled in semantic equivocations that distort morality so that they can perpetrate these, these, you know, these out-group, in-group things where you can sort of scapegoat systemic stresses on, on a particular you know, kind of... Um, you create a kind of a, 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 a toxic polemic uh, that that offloads and diverts blame on onto just a particular thing where you're not even responsibly dealing w with with what's going on um, at all. And look, I mean, sometimes these are these things are purely intellectual, and I think the same thing has has always happened within, for example, scientism and the so-called intellectual scientific community. I think has been rife with this in a purely intellectual way. Now that this has broken out into the more political, cultural uh, ver variant of the same thing, uh, we see it co-opting sexuality. Politics has displaced sexuality. Um, so, sorry, this gets to the point that, that I didn't make right at the beginning. That... Um, The, the political displacement of sexuality um, in which you can only be bestowed a kind of sec sexual energy that is is um, doled out to you uh, if you take on the correct introjective self-object which the narrative um, uh, uh, says is okay and, and, and is the non-controversial way of, of fitting in. Um, and this, this coping mechanism as well as a, on a collective level takes the heat off of individual development. It takes the heat off of individual maturation because you don't have to, you don't have to work on your false self if you're part of a collective false self that is kind of being um, cultivated for you as, as, a, as a cog in the system, because you've outsourced a part of, um, of psychological reality into a mythology, into a narrative, um, you know, into some kind of toxic polemic around identity that bestows, you know, sort of moral things on people um, you know and, and 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 you can see it in their tone policing that they just want people to get on the bandwagon don't be controversial you know you have to toe the line you you have to follow the spirit of the times um, you know like this is the wrong time and place for coherent morality. Um, you must be pushed by our narrative. And, you know, and, and they've used sexuality um, to do this. Uh, they, they have um, colonized it uh, with their ideology. And, you know, I, I think the only way to get this back... Um, is to have institutions and experts that you can call on to hold the line and to be the filtration system and to vet institutions and the health of of um, of, 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 of organizations. You know, you, you need a, you, you need to work out a a, a filtration system um, which has to operate somewhat on, on the private scale. And when I say private scale, I mean on the scale of culture. Where people can can use these as as coordinating with each other and using tools and saying, oh yes, well you know we'll ask this foundation because this foundation worked out this criteria and they know a lawyer who knows how to defend this kind of court case, 
because when we've said that no we we don't want these people teaching at a school and and we have fired them before for for promulgating unconstitutional you know sort of um racialist filth And perhaps also, you know, sort of giving rankings and ratings to corporations that virtue signal and that, you know, sort of um, uh, have tried to get into the realm of morality and do a piss poor job of it um, as, as they create a kind of moral support for, for the bumbling fascists and authoritarians and the kind of, and, and the journalists that, 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 uh, um, promulgate this kind of filth um, and, and the kind of the, the, the moral gaslighting. Anyway, um, sorry, I'm hopping on my, uh, so I'm meant to be focused on, on uh, uh, psychology here. So, yeah, I think that the feminine might be that because the feminine is trying to integrate the superego with the, that the, that the, let's say, the successful feminine psychology integrates the emergent response with the unconscious emotional tone and the superego to the detriment of their own stimulus, to the, to the detriment of their own subconscious integration, that they have, it's not as if women can't succeed in integrating all four. I'm just saying that like, these are kinds of the orders of priority. So, and this probably adds to the, 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 the in other, in other epochs, the success of the idiocentric complementary nature of, of the heterosexual um, coupling is that the, there's specialization on the level of psychology is that the, uh, the woman um, has, has a high, high ranked on her uh, psychological development, the integration of the unconscious, the superego and the ego. And uh, the man has high ranked uh, integration between the subconscious and the unconscious and the ego. And so the the weakness or, or and i mean obviously you know individuals are, are going to be different etc etc but in general in in general the last thing perhaps for the female to integrate is the subconscious and the last thing for the male to integrate is the super ego kind of thing might might sort of be the um might be the the the, the distinguishing demarcation essentially in in terms of um the actual significance that gender has in psychology. Um, and I think that this distinction um, is, 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 is deeply manifest in, let's say, the psychological component of the culture war itself, you know, where you see this incredibly toxic femininity that pretends to be a kind of omnisex or, or something like that, which is, is, I don't think it, I mean, uh, Sam Vaknin says all these things, which I think are overt overgeneralizations and, and bad reductions and approximations that they are trying to be women. I mean, I think that that's the, that might be the ideological byline, but it's certainly not uh, what's happening. I think they are very clearly, um, a female archetype, you know, the kind of the discordia, the, the heiress, but the kind of the um, tyrannical and un, unsatisfiable kind of heiress, the kind of the, the purely malevolent, um, you know, where, because there's one thing to reject order, there's one thing to reject order when one can expect a higher synthesis or a better alternative of order. There's one thing to, you know, that essentially you don't, uh, you know, I mean, to put, to just make a practical example, that doesn't make my point uh, exactly. Uh, but, um, you know, you, you reject a man and you reject a man's courtship because you have an idea, because you have a higher ideal 
that you're waiting out for or something like that, or you have an idea about what you actually want. But if you just reject all men uh, uh, and, and instead you make a relationship that is founded on the grievance of all, uh, against all men and the vilification against all men, um, you know, it's kind of, uh, and you're instead married to the, I the ideology that wields only grievance and has no, even a vision of what the solution would even look like. That, that is how I see this, um, it's, it's like the, the borderline that is even capable of devouring its own cerebral histrionics because it's looking inwards to the field circuit. It's not even looking to have that Oedipal mother tyrannical dictatorship being, um, being in some kind of sustainable, you know, it's, it's fundamentally not a kind of sustainable um, because it's kind of it it's being it's self-referential it's um it i also i've described the components of this is that it has two simultaneous you know kind of um formulas which it's running simultaneously uh, and both of those formulas don't work they're both fudged and then they just kind of juggle between the two as a kind of Mott and Bailey bait and switch shell game. So, you know, they have the kind of the, the sociological plan, which they say, well, we just need to do this blanket statement. We just need to do this blanket, you know, kind of solution. And then on the other hand, they say, well, we just need to adopt this language and this definitional matrix. And if you just accept that these words mean these things, by definition, by pure assertion, then then it reinforces the sociological plan. And so if you say, well, that doesn't that definition doesn't work out, then they say, yeah, but without these definitions, we won't do the right thing on the ground. We won't perform the sociological plan. And if you say, well, the sociological plan is stupid and it doesn't look at reality, they say, you are an evil person. Don't you understand that this means that? That these words equate to this. And, and moral equivocation. And so they're both reliant on, e on each other in this kind of... And, and that's, that, I think, is the kind of... The homosexuality of the Eris archetype with the Eris archetype. The discordia with the discordia. And, and that, that essentially is, is a poison pill. And there is no solution to it. You can't especially in a liberal democracy, you can't say, we're going to lock you up now. We, we've, we've moved on from the sanatoriums. We don't have the sanatoriums to save us anymore. And I, nor do I think that we should use the sanatoriums to save us. What we need to do is we have to develop structures that are resilient to this poison. And then we just have to say, well, you know, we're going on without you you know, and we'll tolerate you to some degree, but we're not going to put you in leadership positions. We're not going to make you, we're not going to give you the influence over children. We're not going to give you the influence over people's minds because you're, you're morally repugnant and, and there are no values in, in your worldview. You know, you're just a destructive, um, you know, sort of a, a moral abyss, you know, and We'll tolerate you, uh, and it is good for us to tolerate you, because if we can learn to tolerate you, then we'll never have to fear fascism again, because you are the moral engine of fascism as well. I mean, that's, that's what this is. And so if we can just get to grips with this, and we can work out filtration systems, then I think that, you know, uh, it's, it's a good thing, as it were. But can we get our shit together? Can we weed out the, the manipulation and weed out the, the kind of the, the moral blackmail and the, and the semantic hostage taking? Can we fight these things? It's, um, can we organize uh, in, 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 in such a way as to hold a fence and have the experts in a row that, that, that we can because that, that's what we needed. We needed the sanatorium not to be a place. We needed it to be part of the culture. Because that is how we actually get a handle on this thing. 
That is actually how we become safe from this thing because it's fine saying, well, society is safe from this thing, but then we leave the poor children to be abused by these Oedipal mothers as well. I think that if we have a culture that understands this, and in some sense, we did have a culture that understood this, the, the, the non-sexual uh, sexism and the non-racism of the 1950s, sorry, of, of the 1990, in 1995, we had all these moral questions solved. We had everything. We had the ethical structure of the future. We had the ethical structure of, of, uh, um, of Star Trek. And we threw it all away, and I'll say that we probably threw it all away because there was a generation of girls and women who could feel the lack of power. They could feel that they didn't have the same implements of social manipulation. We had a new generation of borderline women and, and, and other people and cerebral histrionics. They, we can't separate them. These, these people have their own... They, 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 they would like a different society. The cerebral history, the male cerebral, I mean, look, I'm generalizing. It's not as if you can't have a female histrionic and a male borderline. But, but I think that um, socially and culturally, this is how it manifests. That we, we have male cerebral histrionics and they don't function without an Oedipal mother to bolster or to run errands for and to promulgate the kind of the rule system that they can also be part of, 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 of developing the machination thereof, because as they develop the rules, they can also, you know, know they know where the trap doors are. They, they can then play their magic tricks and, and they can, you know, sort of play these mirror games as, as well. And they can get people caught up in, into toxic binds. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, talked about you know and this this has existed in science this exists all the time in science um as well in a kind of purely intellectual uh, variant of the same kind of thing where this is happening in pure abstraction in pure um almost a kind of uh, in terms of the intellectual model of these things you'd be very surprised just how often um uh, 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 anyway, uh, uh, that's a tangent. I, 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 I don't want to talk about that tangent too much. But, I mean, I, I said right from the start, I said that scientism was the model after which wokeism modeled itself. And it's the same thing that happened in Nazi Germany, where it was the Darwinism of the time that was used to create race, uh, 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 sorry, it was used to create Aryan studies, just like it's, it's the... Um, the critical race theorists of our time that have been used to create, uh, um, you know, these these failed policies, failed morality, um, this this false, uh, this hyper realism, and and this gaslighting of coherent reasoning and morality, um, so that you have to go through them. They have to tell you they because they are the ones unfolding the narrative. They are the ones spinning. The, the the narrative web the 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 yarn of of uh, they they're, they're they're charting the the course you know and it's completely you know anti democratic liter you know it, it it is the 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 stuff of democratic illiteracy um, it is the end of responsible or accountable politics um, because you are treated as an identity and you'll just be bestowed on what the system owes your identity. As the individual integrity is dissolved into the vat of some kind of category system, which is arbitrarily taken to be the canonical one. And so, you know, they just keep on bringing up these relativistic narrative frameworks that center around some matrix of breakdown between people, some categorization between people. And they never morally test these, these, um, they, they only treat them as, as generalizations. They never morally test them uh, and, and actually say how politics or policy could help individuals 
that have individual problems. It's always how do you treat the, the group? How do you treat the category? How do you treat the collective? And the policy just systematizes and scapegoats. It doesn't make particular measures that target particular disadvantages. You know, it's, it's utterly inexcusable. The, 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 the moral black box, the, the, the unknown quantity of fudge which is used to double down and continue the, the never-ending uh, discourse of, of irresponsible politics because people can grandstand and say, well, this is the new definition of non-racialism. Or well, this is the new definition of, of non-sexism. Completely lost the moral compass. Anyway, um, and they can only do that because when they're talking in that valence, they do have the ring. Uh, they do have the, 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 they are speaking from the perspective of the Lord of the Rings, that they are above all. And they are invisible and, and they are above all to objectify the system. That they can speak as if they can objectify the system. They can speak on behalf of the... I mean, it's such a... It's, it, it's, it's at such odds with their own rhetoric that it's, you know... It, you can, this is where the... The spirit of the Fuhrer is completely alive in their ideology. That's, that's where it lies. It's, it's somewhat hidden, but it's there. It is the crux of each of their insipid, insidious moral rationalization, which displaces morality. And, and, and that's what tone policing is, is um, uh, you know, and are we going to boil to death in the tone policing, essentially? Or are we, going to, are we going to call it out and at least develop some kind of fence against the moral policing? Um, and man the fence, and send our experts to the fence, and go to the fence and hire a lawyer when we have a particular controversy, but also, you know, develop the resources to man the fence. Anyway, um, I, I wanted to talk more about the sexual stuff, um, or the, the, the sex. And, I mean, you know, that this is how the women have spread this. Uh, just as the females in the Nazi movement were the ones who made the Nazis popular. The Nazi movement was nothing without its women. Its women uh, forced the men into the movement. Quite honestly, they did. And in the exact same way that the women forced the men into identity politics, at least the ones that, that aren't natural occurring cerebral histrionics as they kind of convert them into cerebral histrionics. We are, we are seeing a version of individual psychology on, on the small scale. Um, anyway, so, look, I'm getting all over the place. Um, but, uh, okay, oh, I didn't talk about narcissism. Okay, so, I think narcissism, now, now you see, I, I do think that there's a huge difference between cerebral histrionics and narcissists. But, it's a difference in kind, but not a difference in, in some sense, in the quality of the modus operandi is kind of the same, but the, the actual, the structural reason for the same kind of interface, it, it's weird. I, I do think that the cerebral histrionic is fundamentally acting in bad faith, because I think that they know the name of the game and they play it anyway. That they are, they are consciously playing the game. They think this is what reality is. This is what it means to be a citizen in a society. This is, the, the cerebral histrionic is, is, not, is not insane. They are morally corrupt. That's my general point about cerebral histrionics. The narcissist is dependent on an Oedipal mother interjective they are dependent on narcissistic supply which is supplied by a kind of their their environmental field of narcissistic supply is the oedipal mother if i can put it like that look I'm, i might have to sort of cl clean up this jargon a bit but i don't think that that is too much of a stretch 
of, of a, um, to see what I'm modeling here is that the, when, when the narcissist was young, they did not have access to an open, to open metagram pathways. They did not have the affection of these metagram pathways. They did, they did not have the luxury of um, toying with them, of playing with them, of um, exploring them. Because there was a field circuit that was cordoned off and was dictated in their environment. Or, and I do think that there is an alternative, is that, because I do believe that there are many people that go through the same abuse that narcissists have gone through, but that they are resilient to that trauma because they just kind of make a more complex coping mechanism as it were um, where you know and, and I mean I would count myself as, as one of these as well like I think I I mean I've never been able to quantify it until I've you know done more psychological modeling and research and things like that but I believe that um, that you can have a kind of intuitive understanding as to how you are being um decompartmentalized and uh and have an intuitive reading on that and um realize the importance of not being decompartmentalized by Oedipal mother you know kind of um situations of abuse i'm going to say that because it's not i i want to refer to it as the archetypal because the same kind of Oedipal mother abuse can just as much i think be the same kind of decompartmentalization can be perpetrated by a narcissistic, tyrannical father. Um, anyway, uh, perhaps slightly differently is that the, na the narcissistic uh, trauma might be to actually specifically destroy the integration that one might develop from the stimulus to the primary counter off or from the stimulus to the emergent response. So, so the, it kind of, the one is trying to cut, you know, so like, you know, if you want to explore and play and engage normally and feel the affection, the kind of, let's say in the, in a normal cocoon of a developmental environment, you, you, you would have the availability of the metagram pathways, whereas the narcissistic tyrannical father will cut the strings of your toying and playing, and the mother will instead cordon off and make and make make it costly for you to. You know, the, 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 there will be a price for for trespassing. So. You know, they, they will kind of be two different styles of abuse, but they will essentially amount to the same thing that they could leave to some kind of imprint of what I'll call something like the, the, that the, the environment has, has an external um, narrative or a kind of uh, um, an objective that, that, that in some objective way there's an Oedipal mother um, a cosmic Oedipal mother that is implanted or imprinted on within your own metagram pathways, you know, that, that it has made a field circuit or made certain pathways um, beleaguered, that they have taxed those pathways. Um, okay, so... And I think this is also why narcissists can have a very, a very profound intellectual analysis of certain things because they can specifically see the strings that are being employed to make the point and they can specifically cut one of those strings or target or, or sort of, um, so, so, you know, they, they have a kind of over cynical overbearing caustic you know kind of vitriolic uh, I, I mean it in the intellectual sense not vitriolic 
but but uh, but you know but obviously the problem is is the sadistic impetus behind this but also that they perhaps don't have a model of integration they only have a model of disintegration and in some sense a lot of their strategy might be in aggregating to themselves narcissistic supply is that they want you to feed into their Oedipal mother, their objective Oedipal mother, uh, or at least their territory, their field of, of aggregating narcissistic supply. And, they, and you won't do that if you have your own internal psychology that is independent and stable. You have to be kind of deranged enough to, to fall into their drama where they can plot you and they can place you and then they can kind of vicariously siphon off your psychic energy because they they need an Oedipal mother to be served. So they are the true believers of the cerebral history. So I think that narcissists and cerebral histrionics are doing the same thing, but they have very different motivational structural makeup. The, the cerebral histrionic is doing it as a kind of bad faith. The narcissist is doing it out of a kind of psychological necessity. They, ha they only know the Oedipal mother model, whereas the, the cerebral histrionic does it as a way to offset spiritual philosophy development or, or metamorality. They do it to stay in Keegan stage three, or if I can put it like that kind of thing. Uh, they, 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 are, they are bunkered into the nihilism. They have just cynically gotten into some kind of nihilistic sort of um, economy. They, they, they can't think of anything else worth doing, so they have to kind of indulge in a kind of slave morality economy. Okay, and... This is why I say it's important for us to get our ducks in a row and get the fence made and get the experts on the fence and go to the fence when you need to defend against these people because this is going to be a perennial problem. This is a problem of the human condition. This is not a problem of, of this. This is because the system was weak because the only because in the history, the only protection that we've had is sanatoriums. And now our liberal philosophy correctly says that we can't use the sanatoriums against these people you know i mean there, there are some scattered true things within some of the things that some of the postmodernists say and some of the is that like you know they say that the, the personal is political well no i'll say the psychology is political and it's a perennial sort of thing and okay that's a okay i shouldn't have phrased that like that but uh Anyway, I, I stated the point that I, that, that I wanted to make anyway. But um, there we go. Uh, we have to find ways to not let the gaslighting in. Because how we let the gaslighting in is how in the new generation we're going to get the same type of social manipulation... Uh, borderline, you know, and, and this is, I mean, you know, these psychopathologies are obviously, I mean, people in psychology know this. These are not just naturally occurring phenomena. These occur because of development. They occur because of, I, I wouldn't call it natural affinity or any kind of natural inclination. It's because of individual decision making in terms of one's young developmental mind. Your, your free will, your agency actually matters. You, you, are, a, uh, you are actually making profound uh, moral decisions at a young age. And you, and you can't necessarily educate people out of that. There are some people who are going to perhaps stumble onto this stuff just by, by their own uh, thorough, uh, th thoroughfare, you know, in their own mind, that they will just choose the bad path. And, um, you know, uh, some parents are, are very unlucky that way, that they have children that, um, I mean, I'd like to think that, that you know, no one is beyond uh, redemption, no one is beyond um, pedagogical, you know, sort of um, 
education and, and development. Uh, and, and I would like to see advances in these things. I would like to see advances in education and in morality and in society. But on some level, uh, we, we have to put the right onus on the right, you know, that, that this is a failing of culture um, uh, in as much as that the culture keeps on giving the politicians the rope with which to hang the culture, you know, in an in, in even more horrible um, lurch. And, and I don't think that you don't blame the politicians for this. I blame the culture for this, that, uh, um, you know, we have fallen into this idea that we should just be a state, a state owned culture, a state run society, a state, you know, and uh, anyway, um, which is, you know, obviously a, a kind of, anyway, one way to, 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 and I mean, the, the, the traditional solution to this is to strengthen a republic, is that you have justice etched into the republic, not into the democracy. You have it beyond the democracy, but uh, the, I mean, the, that is a solution. Um, it's obviously a solution that doesn't withstand when your actual judges themselves uh, have institutionally corrupted the law. But it's, I mean, there are not many systems in the world that actually had the actual law on paper to effectively deal with this kind of stuff. America naturally is prone to something like a culture war because the, their law itself is not, is not robust enough in being a bulwark against this kind of denigration, which is not to, anyway, I, 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 I place a high currency on the word justice, and I think that it's important that in a society the word justice means something that can be absolutely substantiated and defended with values and principles. And I don't think that you can do that in the American system. And that is because it is the republic and the democracy is entangled in a way that I think is slightly problematic. But that's it's not without uh, America is not as it stands. It's a good enough structure that it could support the solution. But again, it's not through politics. It's going to be mainly through the culture war. In in my country, it's slightly different because the justice system was actually great on paper it was it had it had everything right and it was actually twisted in order to comport with this kind of corruption and how you unfuck that i don't know it's it's a it's a betrayal of the ages it's a crime against humanity um it literally is a crime against humanity and the only excuse is is that their race and gender studies professors lined up with those criminals you know i mean these people i really hold them in the same ranks as as nazi war criminals these are the same morally they are of the same ilk that they, they have the same poison ideology that leads to genocides they 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 have no moral compass they they are part of of these borderline psychopathic networks Sorry, okay, I'm really going off the rails here. I should have been speaking about the difference between narcissists and cerebral histrionics. It does kind of dovetail to that, though. So, you know, you can see that the cerebral histrionics are like the journalists and the academics. And the politicians are perhaps the more true believers are the actual narcissists and the because i mean they all have a cut of the pie they all get a role in this demise in this vortex in this abyss that we have fallen into yet again since you know the 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 uh you know the beginnings of world war ii um 
you know, it, it's, it's happening again, essentially. And, um, It's interesting because, I mean, look, there, there is some difference between. Because uh, a lot of the Oedipal mother kind of stuff. Sorry, sorry, I mean, I, I went into all of these uh, uh, things. The point that I was actually uh, trying to, uh, firstly, trying to illustrate or talk on is how. How vulnerable people are to catching psychopathology, how it spreads like a virus, how it, it gets replicated by people, how it gets imprinted on and, and taken, you know, and, and it's, it's very interesting how um, it's spread like wildfire, you know, how it, it gets so popular, but essentially, you know, that it operates like a bandwagon, you know, sort of, uh, you're either with us or you're against us kind of thing. And, um, And women, and especially girls growing up, because of hypergamy, because of the female sexual strategy, it makes sense why they are doubly vulnerable to falling into this, because they have to conform, because the opportunity cost, you know, from, an, from a kind of, from an evolutionary level, the opportunity cost of sticking your head above the parapet for being a woman is just, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, to choose the unpopular path uh, is, is, is a kind of, in, in terms of hypergamy, it's a And, and so, I mean, uh, this is also why I say the importance of the fence. It's important to get the ducks in the road. It's important to get the experts because otherwise we're not going to have a model for a fixing culture. For, uh, which Because you do have to understand that at some point individuals have to consume culture. It's not a structural thing. It's not a system of generalizations. At some point you have to imagine that there's going to be a boy in junior school and high school and the teacher says some sexist, crazy bullshit. And the boy says, oh, you're one of those. And then she says, what, what, what? And then, and then he gets sent to the principal's office. And there's a court case and, sh and, and she gets fired. The, the teacher gets fired. We need justice like that. And, and, and we need uh, we need a way to, to, to mediate. I mean, okay, so, I mean, there are lots of variations of the same kind of hypothetical story. Rather, you know, that he, that, that, you know, it's not like a huge thing. It's like, okay, well, you disagree with the teacher. You're probably stupid. I'm older than you. I have more experience than you. He can trot out some kind of basic, simple arguments that that stumps her or that she can't seem to do, and then other people bully him in class, uh, and he sticks to his guns, and at some point, some girl whispers in his ear, "Yeah, that that what you say makes sense." Or, or maybe he's having a conversation and some girls are, you know, uh, they just throw scorn at him and other girls, they are, maybe they're on the fence and, uh, uh, and there's a kind of segregation that, that, that forms around that, that coalesces around that. And until we can sort of dignify that kind of segregation of, of removing oneself in a principled way, that, that sets us apart, as it were, but not in a way that we have to win, just in a way that we can just hold our ground and that we can create some kind of aura of uh, tranquility and, and coherence and non-insanity. I mean, I, sorry, this is... Um, I mean, the amount of times that I went through this in, in my schooling, I mean, is, is sort of, 
it never ended, actually. I mean, this is a, re a recurring motif for me. Uh, so, I mean, I, I feel like I've, I've been through this trial by fire, as it were. But um, and they, they don't have to be many flagships that do that, really. Um, but there does need to be some. There do need to be some models. Um, for the culture to coalesce around and uh, and it's interesting also the distortion of education uh, and, and, and the lowering of quality in the, in the moral stuff. And I'm just repeating myself. Let, let me end this recording. Um, sad that I kind of had to end it on that sort of self-aggrandizement. Let me think if I can mellow that out into some kind of general point. But um, obviously, you know, in the scenario where the teacher gets fired, at least in my legal system, there would have been criteria set out by the judges. And then that criteria would have been, it would be in the system. It would be available to people to read that judgment and read that criteria back to teachers and say, you are actually crossing the line into indoctrination. I'm here for an education, not to be indoctrinated. And so, you know, the, we need the experts on the fences, we need the models. And in some sense, I, I think it is the, um, you know, the whole COVID debate has, has this all over it as well. You know, it's like, the problem is, is that the, the actual process, the decision-making process is disgusting and dishonest. We're not having a rational conversation about the trade-offs of things, Glenn, Glenn Greenwald's um, thing, which I'll post a link to that as well. Anyway, so, yeah, man, I went through so much stuff here because I augmented something that I stated in my Metagram recording, which is a very embarrassing and long recording, and then I talked a lot about culture, war, and politics, and anyway. And I didn't even make a proper point about the sexuality essentially how sexuality has been taken hostage by the narrative and you know you you have to sort of you know the, the idea is, is that you kind of get maybe sex or you hypothetically get sex as a reward or or you get the ability to have a relationship with someone who is inverted commas a feminist or something like that by being useful or something like that or, or, or by being um, part of the solution or that you're, you, you're not allowed to have sexuality unless you comport yourself in such a way that is compatible with the ideological narrative. Um, so they've kind of, they've, they've assailed sexuality and let's say organic natural sexuality that they have created an ideological um, political substitution uh, to, 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 in some sense, I, I think it's, it's also been to project things into masculine preferences. Oh, the reason why society is unjust is because men have, men have to subdue their sexual preferences to our ideological objectives. You need to start finding things, other things attractive. Otherwise, we can't and make progress until you change your your instinctual biology or, or your own discerning and judgment of things you you can't you can't uh, uh, have your values you have to have these collective values of the narrative you can't have your independent judgment of things you have to have a kind of ideologically subverted judgment 
that is part of the, the, the cloud solution, the system, it, you know, so men become the thing that becomes the, the, the fabric of, of, the, of the change that needs to be in the world. They are the, the medium of, of that change. They are the blank canvas. They are dehumanized into essentially the instrument of, of the, of, for the scapegoat of the system is, you know, sort of the, the sexual preferences of men. And so because people feel that the, they're also, the, the politics facilitates that they can ideologically project whatever they want onto men's sexual preferences, they have dehumanized male sexuality, um, and they have dehumanized boys from sexuality. Like, like they, they've said, you, you are, you are decompartmented. You can't have your own sexuality. Your sexuality must be regulated by the ideology because you're not a safe entity. You, you, and and the, the amount of evil that your sexual preferences perform in the system is a kind of, is a never-ending unknown quantity that can be used as the motivation to extract more demands against you. So you have that kind of argument levied against men and boys. And that's obviously very stifling. It's very developmentally crippling because it's psychologically penetrative. You know, it's like you can't even have your own mentality. You can't have your own subjective framework. You have to adopt the collective generalized lens. And so you get implanted. The Oedipal mother control of, a, of, a, an ob of objective reality is implanted into you. It's like in the Matrix when they have that little thing that looks like a, a machine that then turns into a parasite that gets injected in that becomes the you you you're, the our children are being injected with these trackers so that if they if they break the code of of the of the conformity of of the tone policing then they'll turn into an agent smith they they you know um What's the point? Um, and under these conditions, it makes sense that there's there's a kind of hypersexuality because this is not this is purely artificial, and people. Uh, People have a, a natural need for intimacy. And when you have dislocated intimacy from sex, and you've created all this inauthentic, you know, kind of stuff that's ideological and, and stuff like that, and all these, you know, this collective shame and this collective guilt, and all these collective generalizations and stereotypes that get levied onto the onto sexuality, where sexuality has been bastardized as a kind of political outlet. Um, women are essentially expressing their sexuality by their political projection onto male sexuality. And that is like a, a charge that goes unanswered, perhaps, uh, for people who who can who even feel unsettled by it, or at least know on some level it just it doesn't work. This whole this whole mind forged manacle essentially is a kind of um, you know is kind of parasitic to male sexuality, and so th there's a kind of there's a there's a torment and there's a kind of yeah. You know, I mean, you can see I call them I always used to call them feminist traps. Uh, because, you know, sort of the feminist that goes around in very revealing clothing because they're trying to sort of goad people into looking so that then they can plaster them with a kind of diatribe and some kind of ideological slew of accusations. You know, it's, um, you know, it's, it's almost similar to the kind of cry bully kind of thing. But, you know, it's also when you see the race, it's, it's very similar to the race baiting thing. Um, You know, or, and I think that that is the kind of sexual perversity of our age. And um, you 
people in intimacy have a natural inclination to shed the skin of identification that gets lobbed onto them. They have a natural tendency, I think at least in healthy sexuality as well, to toy with things, to explore things, to deconstruct them and to dissolve them and to discharge them. And I think that these societal connotations and stereotypes and ideological projection is something that people want to dissolve. And, and you can, but I mean, it can also be the cause of, of addictions as well and things like that. Um, you know, if, if you are not, you know, if you actually just like monotonously subjecting yourself to a kind of, um, uh, gimmick, you know, that, that is literally what I would think the word kink means. Um, and this, this, I think these things will all be hedged on some actual fundamental belief in some fundamental world view. Most people have the world view that society affects them because society does affect them, even if it doesn't affect them directly, it does affect them to, to some degree indirectly. And the psychological cost of that, I think, can be ameliorated by a kind of healthy intimacy. And um, self-exploration and and perhaps even a kind of um, ritualist I don't know, this is getting a, a bit in the weeds here but uh, that I that I think that the the depth the, the full depth of intimacy is essentially reconstructing the ego in in relation to the super ego which is symbolic of the very first kind of ontological development of one's own personal psychology was the emergence of the ego from the superego. And so that is the oldest um, structure in the mind. And when you share someone, when you share that with someone, when you commu communicate that with someone, it gives you the confidence, essentially, to reconstitute your sense of self from the ground up, because you can kind of, you can replay or you can relitigate the emergence of your core self, of, of the first, you know, emergent self. And that's really what true intimacy is. And when it's deluded by gimmicks and by and it's when it's obsessed and utterly plugged into the realm of politics and culture and your environment when essentially the point of intimacy is not to discharge these things um, and to work through them and to work out how you exist in contradistinction to them and to see yourself distinguished and separate from them but when you are part of the play if you're part of the environmental narrative because that is part of your being because you've believed in some blood and soil lived experienced mythology and disgusting um, sort of world view and, and framework a, a fascistic framework then you have to get into the the horrible mechanical bullshit of uh, you know sort of maybe dominatrix type bullshit because you know that that kind of submission and that kind of because I mean that's I, I think that that's the whole question in the whole dominatrix setup is is there is there real love behind domination is there real love in subjugation and it is it is completely obsessed with the surrender and the subjugation to the absolute power of some environmental narrative of something that is happening to you that you're not consensually you know it, it is and I, I think that all these people they are idolaters of a kind of, um, they don't believe in liberty, they don't believe, they, they believe in the beastly condition of man, they believe in the conditioning of us by our environment, the camouflage of us by our, by our lived experience. There is no authentic self there, and they have no authentic integrity, and they have given up their dignity to trade it for a kind of power game, which is their kind of sexuality. And so, 
there's a lot of confused sexual energy in in culture and uh, it's very unhealthy and uh, it's going to continue to to um, Yeah, and so I mean the, the kind of overt sexual sexualization, you know, the kind of um, display, uh, the cons the conspicuous display of sex and culture, and re is 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 an, is another part of the degradation of intimacy. And, but also the transfer of intimacy, because these people are being intimate. They are being as, as intimate as they can be in their fucking politics. Their politics is their intimacy. That's why they don't have, they don't have a boundary between the personal private bedroom and the, the public political discourse is, is to them the same thing. They're litigating the one and the other. And so they can never develop as an individual. Um, they can only develop as these kind of half-breed, half borderline, cerebral histrionic, chimera, sort of, you know, they, they, they're a different kind of species. They are a kind of Nazi supporter. They, they are a different kind of, of citizen. Um, they are the identitarian slave masses, you know, they, they are the slave morality. And, and so, you know, they have messed up, yeah, the, the cost of this is messed up sexuality. And, and obviously, you know, uh, they send waves of this through the culture. And it is disgusting. Um, What's worse is that it's it's damaging uh, in the normalization of it. You know, and, and and this is why we have laws against the exposure of of minors to to sort of sexual content to some degree. Although I've made complicated remarks on that, but essentially, I mean that's why I think when sex is displayed to minors, it should be displayed in maybe in narrative plots that are appropriately also age ranked, but also that, you know, that, that let's say that there is an actual portrayal of intimacy and not just the act of sex, but also that there perhaps should be restrictions on sex in advertising, in over, you know, that the, the overt and over, overused, you know, the kind of, when sex has become a kind of se a cultural currency, when it's proliferated and such a cheapened cultural currency, that, that that's the problem. It's not that sex can't be in culture, it's the cheapening of sex in culture is essentially, it's, it's not about, and, and, and the cheapening of it will have to do with the quantity, but, you know, it's mainly a qualitative argument, sadly, which, which is what makes it a little bit problematic to try to um, to legislate. But essentially, yeah. Anyway, um, let, let, I could let me not go on forever. But um, yeah. So what I didn't mention was that in some way, the narcissist also wants you to become a cerebral histrionic but maybe even a different kind of cerebral histrionic, one that is more conscious, that essentially with, along with other people who have been conditioned by the narcissist to collectively support the kind of the objective Oedipal mother scenario or Gortland or kind of, you know, to, to, to play the role needed in the, as introjective objects in, uh, you see, uh, I, I haven't, I haven't streamlined this terminology, but essentially I'm saying that like introjective objects exist within the, the Oedipal mother kind of uh, territory, which is the same. So, so like the, the source of narcissistic supply is the Oedipal mother and the constituents of the Oedipal mother for a narcissist 
is could either be a borderline or it could be a slew of of cerebral histrionics or both that where the cerebral histrionics are collectively compounding together to construct this um arena or this uh you know sort of field that is capable of uh, generating narcissistic supply um because it's kind of an objective narrative um it, it's a kind of uh, uh that that can protect itself by diverting pressure onto an unknown quantity uh, uh into an unknown quantity that can be levied on the head of a scapegoat that doesn't sort of comport with that structure or, or with that culture that has this kind of ideological sort of groove um etched into it and so the and so you can see that the narcissist perhaps cutting the strings of an individual's connection between their individual stimulus subconscious um, emotional tone and their primary counter offer and emergent response emotional tones because instead they want the Oedipal mother to be constructed. And then the Oedipal mother must provide the a kind of a, a zero sum hierarchy and identity that sort of facilitates or substitutes for the connection between the stimulus and the emergent response and primary counter offer. And maybe actually the super ego should be should be part of that explanation that I just gave is, is maybe that um, that, that would convolute it to some degree that I can't think of exactly how, how that would plug in that perhaps it's the the narcissist relationship to their own superego is so strong that they can't develop their own independent metagram circuitry because then for a moment they would their 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 own ego would be um I think that there that the narcissist has an imprint of their own ego. Uh, they have a kind of connection between their ego and their subconscious, but between the stimulus and the emergent response, and that that also that that imprint is also connected with the super ego, but it's not connected with the unconscious, and so they need a substitute for the unconscious side of the mind. And the subconscious is also hobbled and, and sort of strangely half-formed and unanchored. Because without an integrated subconscious and unconscious, the ego can also not even have stability. But also the subconscious is, is going to kind of, you know, it's... Um, it's like you have a kite and you have a kite string, but you don't have an anchor on the ground um, or in this example they don't have they have I don't know what, they have the anchor and they have the kite but they don't have the kite string they need that to sort of be outsourced to the Oedipal mother um, where only some people get kite strings and some people don't get kite strings and they need that because otherwise they don't know whose kite is where they don't know where the kites are in relation to one another they have to kind of unless there's this collective apportioning of kite strings according to the Oedipal mother uh, that is regulating and substituting for the um and so I know that I've seemingly contradicted myself that saying that the the narcissist has a connection to their own emergent response uh, uh, from their 
stimulus or from their subconscious, but the subconscious connected with the emergent response is not is not a stable connection, is not real integration, and in some sense is more just a bridge to exalt the superego and to exacerbate the superego, which essentially diminishes and hollows out the subconscious fundamentally. So I think that essentially the, the subconscious exists just as a pawn for the superego to kind of Uh, transmit and align the the ego with the super ego via the subconscious, which is merely being used as a kind of as a vehicle for that. So that, but that also and that com that and that perfectly lines up with the fact that the primary counter offer the emergent uh, the, the, the 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 unconscious side of the mind is has to be outsourced. Because if it were at all developed, it wouldn't allow for the subversion of the subconscious, the subversion of the stimuli. So, in, and now I'm going to say something that that's, is in, consistent with everything that I've said before, but it's, it's, it's confusing. Is that the superego, you must remember, is the other side of the primary counteroffer. So in some sense, the primary counter offer, which is, which is predominantly a, 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 the emotional tone that, that is the, the, the basis of the unconscious side of the mind, is also the front of the superego as well, being reflected through the unconscious. But because the superego is got a hand in the subconscious and a hand in the ego and it's actually much more unnatural that it has a hand in the subconscious because the subconscious is just usually independent from it um, the subconscious is usually very capable of debunking the super ego the super ego's only weakness is the subconscious um, and this is, it has a natural weakness. Um, the superego has a natural weakness to the subconscious, which is important to note because that, uh, that is usually where the impetus for an independent internal locus control comes from. It comes from the stimulus. It comes from, from the subconscious. Um, the only way that the subconscious can continue to be a shell for the super ego is because the ego is so bastardized and prone to confabulation and cognitive dissonance. So there's, a, I, I see it as a semi-stable structure of a bastardized subconscious, a brittle ego and that is married to the stability of the superego, so much so that it cannot experience its own unconscious side of the mind without it being a kind of collective drama, without it being an environmental Oedipal mother doing the work externally that they can vicariously use by associating through that drama. So they need, they need other people's psychology to be infused in their environment in order to and and this this I say makes them a true believer, but it also makes them a facilitator of producing cerebral histrionics by cutting their integration between their unconscious side of the mind and uh, their their subconscious, or at least the integration between the subconscious, the unconscious, and the um, emergent response, which is I would say the archetypal masculine. You know, this is in some sense, I think this, what I'm describing is the actual mechanics of the king, the, the return of the king, the return of the lion heart, you know, as, as um, you know, uh, this, symbolically, this has been spoken about by, um, oh, man, this is so embarrassing. I'm so bad with names. Um, Paul Vanderclay talks with him often, uh, the, you know, the, the Canadian, um, 
artisan of uh... anyway uh, people know who I'm referring to it's um, apologies for not remembering people's names um you know, Jordan Peterson is friends with him as well, and he's a Canadian icon crafter. Uh, makes religious icons for the Orthodox churches. But um, anyway, uh, I, I think that the the lion heart, you know, sort of symbol archetype, rectifying the situation, is again what I've just described, the, which is something like a the affirmation or the vindication of of let's say the healthy masculine psychological integration, as it were. But it's not the f the true trans transcend transcended integrated psy uh, psyche. You know that requires that I think is essentially only achieved by Christ uh, in in terms of um, uh, uh, is is symbolically um, illustrated through th through through Christ uh, in terms of the the crucifixion and the work of salvation. And that obviously is, is a lot more complicated as well, but um, and how and how this can be translated into a culture that is capable of being spiritually um, edifying, but also let's say uh, politically dignified and satisfying for its individual constituents. I mean, I was kind of implying at the end. Look, I mean, I I understand to some people I have a lot of paradoxical views in that. Um, and I don't like saying this about myself because I think it is a mischaracterization, but technically, uh, according to a lot of Christian um, commentators on this topic, I am not a supporter of, uh, I'm not pro-life. I mean, I would say that I am culturally pro-life, but and I, I do believe that it is important to gain the protection of God, one needs to defend God. But how that is done in a liberal political situation, I think, is is uh, worthy of being. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but perhaps I, sh I should go through it. But um, this is such a long recording. Um, The idea that some things are evil and wrong and are, and are sins, and the idea that that we can sort of make sin unlawful, I think that this is um, that is even abstractly a problem. Um, I understand that, that that's not you know perhaps the level at which um, the right to life uh, is conceived. Um, conceptualized by these people um, but essentially I think that it is to it is to elevate the importance of culture and morality to make some things that are incredibly evil. I mean, and you know, I I actually wanted to to make this point to amend what I was saying about um, the conspicuous overuse of sex within the culture that has cheapened it. That that is also you know like you I don't believe that you can. I I, I see it as conceivable as outlawing advertising that is sexual. I think that one could make, let's say, a public health psychological claim about that. Um, and that one can take a democratic mandate to place those kinds of restrictions. I think those kinds of 
if, if they reflect the mores of society, I see, you know, why a society can't have essentially a more conservative appetite around those things, but also that it could be uh, related to the health of the culture in general and uh, the, the healthier development of children. Um, the idea that I care about the development of children, but I don't care about, let's say, the fact that they can be murdered within a certain time window. Um, I think it is a special it is a special case uh, that has its own facets and its own merits and and it, it for me it all boils down to at some point you have to bootstrap li liberal political philosophy within morality and within the culture and within structures of the law and there are some things that on a technical level they just can't be you can't square the circle. There is such a thing as bodily autonomy, there's some, such a thing as freedom of conscience, and there is such a thing as a right to life. And I think that we have to understand that these things are somewhat in conflict. Until we even have the technology to say, okay, well, you want an abortion, you're not allowed to have an abortion, because we've got a machine here that can extract the fetus and preserve its life and gestate it without you, and then we, as the state, can abduct this child and go and give it to an adoptive parent. And, and therefore, we can preserve the life of the child. Until we can develop that kind of technology, which brings us back to the debate, I think. Um, the debate that I would still not want to have, because there are, there are other... You can imagine the perverse incentives in there to sort of to disassociate the the life of the child with the responsibility of the parent or the the person declining to want to be a parent and that at the end of the day is is the real problem is how do you deal with the practicality and the perverse incentives around uh, let me use the phrase unwanted population and at, and at what, I mean, you know, I would even argue that there's a scriptural injunction around here, which is that, you know, that the sins of the parents uh, are visited on the children. And I think that we are going to have a different kind of culture, a different kind of society if we don't bootstrap a kind of responsibility, a kind of moral responsibility somewhere. And we don't actually, I mean, I've, I've made the same argument, and I understand that this is an egregious argument to make, and it's incredibly sort of crude, and, but this is a, let's say, this is a, a special case, that parents should have the right to abuse their children within some bounds. And at some point, we have to work out how to persuade people, how to convince people to be better parents. Otherwise, we don't have a free society anymore. We just have a state-led something. We, 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 have, we, we have a train that you, is, is going off the rails and no one can stop it at that point. Uh, that there has to be some kind of meaning of the word tolerance. And there also simultaneously has to be some respect for individual choice making. And I think that just because the law permits something does not make it moral. And I think that that is an important distinction that has been lost in our time. And that is something that must be reclaimed. That the distinction between what belongs to Caesar... And, and following Caesar's rules, that just because we follow the rules of Caesar does not mean that we consider Caesar to be a moral person. And, and we, we live in the world, and the world is not your church. The world is not your communion. And these distinctions are important distinctions that I think are necessary also for proper psychological boundaries. 
And when we start to blur these lines with the morality that the state is going to enforce, I think that, and, and this comes to a head at abortion, this really comes, this culminates in abortion in a way in which if the right concession is made, and I, and, I, and I consider this to be a technical concession, because I don't like calling myself, well, I'm not pro-life. I think I am pro-life. I think I'm more pro-life than those who simply just want to make a rule and try to benefit from the rule, which creates a toxic... I think that we will end up having much less abortions if we keep it legal and fix the moral rationale of the state. I think that we will have a more pro-life culture and society. That if we continue to say, well, no, we're going to force you not to have an abortion so that you can believe then in your own mind that, well, the state forced me to be a mother out of wedlock or, you know, or whatever. Oh, well, this is now I'm a statistic and I was made a statistic by other people enforcing things onto me. This is what I mean by bootstrapping responsibility. Is that we are giving people the excuse to not have ownership of their life. And I understand that, well, you know, we shouldn't have to gerrymander our morality in order to facilitate those who are just looking for excuses anyway. Uh, look, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm sensitive to that. This is, I'm not making a deductive argument on this point. I'm making a point about having some structural edifice of a pristine bootstrapped response, realm of responsibility and self-determinism and accountability for the individual. And if you can tell people that you've made this concession, I think this concession to the world, this concession to the law, as it were, that the law needs to have consistent values within it, and that there is a, there is a fundamental conflict here, and that in this fundamental conflict between bodily autonomy and the right to life, we erred on the side not on have to work out how to phrase this I was about to say something that is not I want I want to say we erred on the side of not morally condoning murder but morally condoning people's right to choose whether or not to perpetrate murder And then to not punish them for that murder. I also think that this is how you get out of the drug war with the same argument. Because if you get out of the drug war, you might actually get a much better culture on the ground, a much healthier culture on the ground. Because if drugs are very, very cheap and easy to support and completely legal, then there is no incentive for people to get people hooked because there's no profit incentive. There's no criminal money going into the pockets of bad, violent people. Because you can just go down and you can buy it at the supermarket, you can buy a kilogram of cocaine, and you can kill yourself if you want. And we respect, we don't respect your, your 
uh, we don't condone your right to commit suicide, but we condone your right to choose whether or not to commit suicide and we don't punish it. And we do so because on paper there is actually there's an incompatible there's, there's an incompatible um, conflict between basic precepts that but we are going to err on the side of choice and yeah i mean this uh this choice comes at the expense of the alive and yet unborn and one can say that that we are uh that the law the law is casting a blind eye to this but that doesn't have to be the culture the law casting a blind eye does not have to be the cultural social moors and social standards and moral standards casting a blind eye i don't think that there shouldn't be a stigma to these things And yeah, there'll be some people that will be activists and they will make sure that these things are provided for or whatever, whatever. And, uh, and I think that that is how, I think it, that is how it will be conquered in the end. It won't be conquered by legislating morality. And I think that people that want to be pro-life, that, that, that try to cling to this kind of silver bullet... I think that there is a there's a moral murkiness which is hidden in their oversimplification of the issue, which is, and it's it's it, it's thematically similar to a lot of these arguments that I've made in other realms. Um, you know, it's it's the difference between using the sanatorium and actually making the substantive defense and creating the real model of a culture that is pro-life not a state and a legal structure that is so called pro-life by enforcing its pro-life so-called sentiment i don't think we need such sentiments etched into the law i think we need a different kind of law we need a law that has a more stringent rigor in its justice and this is uh, not, this is, I, I understand that this is a bit of an esoteric and sophisticated, um, argument, uh, and it's almost, you know, sort of paradoxical, but, um, this, I think, is the only way to have, uh, this is how it was uh, essentially deliberated in in the in the brilliant and genius formulation of the South African Constitution, um, which is a constitution for a Star Trek society. It is a constitution for for a space aged uh, uh, civilization. Uh, anyway, sorry, but. Uh, it, it stands institutionally betrayed and utterly gutted. The question is, can it be resurrected? And, and can we put a lid on all of this madness um, again? But uh, yeah, so, so, so th this is my sort of... Uh, you know, is actually doing the real work on the ground, as it were.
not just trying to steal the moral authority and the shell of the state and the power of the state. Uh, and this is also my emphasis of why we need justice edged into the republic and not into the democracy. But I mean, the kind of doing the things on the ground that need to be done can still be certainly done in the American system. I mean, any system that basically has a liberal democratic structure should have enough freedom of association and a freedom of contract that's enough to conduct this culture war. In South Africa, we're in a slightly worse position because the law itself actually was perfect. It was correct on these matters, but it has been corrupted, which makes it so much harder. Um, we have a much more robust understanding of what the rule of law actually is in South Africa because of our more sophisticated legal tradition and our superior justice system. Uh, which uh, I understand other foreign people might uh, uh, not appreciate those kinds of claims, but I, I stand behind them and I believe that I could substantiate them. Um, it just so happens that the system in South Africa has, has been politically corrupted, um, which is quite a thing to say because even under apartheid, the judiciary stood in the way of the apartheid government. And the judiciary, you know, we had parliamentary sovereignty and the judiciary stood in the way of parliamentary sovereignty doing whatever the, the hell it thought it could get away with. But now in this new age, the political corruption has gotten so bad that it has intellectually rotted the judiciary and has debased its values and you know the like this is a this is the fascistic perversion of pot of 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 uh, uh, um, legal positivism and and the kind of and and the substitution of values for formal requirements um where principles get hollowed out and semantically confused with, you know, word games and defining things strangely and coming up with terms that have a kind of magical black box inside of them and, you know, you, the, the magic that gets invoked. But, I mean, that, that's what happens when you have a culture that has been hard-boiled by this uh, Look, I mean, this is a corruption that has been with us forever. This is the Leviathan. This is the king of the seas uh, that, that, that has made the world uh, operate according to its, uh, uh, its pattern of chaos and, and never end. You know, I believe that the solutions that I etch out and that I describe, the ideological solutions, these are ones which are our foundations for stability and coherence which is in fact a kind of end of history it's not the end of culture but it is a kind of political end of history um not that politics won't won't have nothing in it to do but it is a kind of i wonder if it is a kind of a morally enlightened technocratic debate uh, that does have some moral questions and but you know that that so i mean i guess it's not exactly technocracy but um maybe i'm using these words slightly uh, uh badly but i i think that this actually quells the toxicity of the spirit of man as it were um Because this doesn't say, well, if you don't like abortion, there's nothing that you can do about it. My solution does not negate uh, there being a kind of um, education, you know, sort of discussion, moral, I mean, but, you know, uh, um, moral discussions and moral discourse. 
the idea that we can only have moral discourse when we, we are fighting over some implement of state authority, I think is also a position that needs to be challenged. Uh, and, and that is sort of, that is the corruption that, that society has fallen into ever since, you know, sort of the state started bearing the dead. Anyway. All right, I, I have something important to add, I guess. I, I don't know why I didn't iterate this before. Um, but I actually think that the borderline has a narcissistic uh, has at least a potentially narcissistic component that the borderline's own subconscious has the same narcissistic configuration or at least the same opportunity of developing that as a, as a structure and then they can kind of operate it as a pincer strategy that both of which are strategies that are at their source located in the superego. So the superego has got two different um, vectors of and and so I think the borderline can operate. I mean, they call borderline the secondary psychopath, uh, and 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 using secondary psychopathy. I think the secondary um, psychopathy defense mechanism is the um, is essentially the narcissistic valence. But it's only different from the narcissist in that it is um, it is uh, essentially it operates literally as a pincer movement. It's it's a it's a way. Well, the the main tactic isn't working, so use the secondary um, the secondary maneuver to try to coerce and corral the situation back towards the main strategy, the main tactical, um, the, 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 the preferred thing. Whereas the, the narcissist also has both components, but is almost structurally quite different in that they probably have an understanding, a kind of, some kind of intrinsic, idea of what the the Oedipal mother um, sort of component is, but they have always relied on it as a, a vicarious external um, psychic organ of of outsourcing their ego and and um, unconscious to some degree or at least that they're that they see their ego in the reflection of the unconscious, vicarious, uh, uh, you know, sort of. Um, so, so there is, there is a more bro. I I think that the the narcissist is more broken essentially. Whereas the the borderline is is more. Um, sort of deploying this, this structure. Um, and the cerebral histrionic is closer to the borderline than they are to the narcissist. But in some sense, I think that the cerebral histrionic is, is almost like a borderline, but has a different preference. This is, so it's like the borderline is a secondary narcissist or a secondary psychopath, whereas a histrionic is like a secondary borderline. And the, the borderline, in some sense, wants a... Um, ideally, I think they want a kind of cerebral histrionic who's willing to do that, 
is is willing to pe to play the second fiddle to do the extra outsourced vicarious work um and to be compatible and subservient to their narrative their unilateral dictation and tyranny over the narrative of their field circuit that they have set up as as their reality tunnel um or uh, a narcissist as well i guess they would because the narcissist is like the true believer so the narcissist would be the person who is overtly vulnerable to the oedipal mother racket and that is sort of is 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 necessarily invested in the kind of in in the the oedipal mother apparatus whereas um the cerebral histrionic is going to be um i don't know i mean uh, i mean maybe there is no particular preference that the borderline would have between these two um i mean you know it's such all of these things are so unsustainable and brittle structures anyway um but yeah, so I, I think the cerebral histrionic is like the inverted borderline. It's, it's literally an inverted borderline in that they just have a different preference. And then in some, sen in some ways, the, the, the cerebral histrionic is like a bad faith narcissist. It's like someone who is pretending, is going through the motions of a kind of narcissism, but doing so with a kind of more integrated conscientiousness about what it is that they are doing, that it is a kind of the idea that the only point of living in communal, in, in a society or in some kind of organization is to actively construct a narrative that people believe in as an objective external authority and to wield that external authority and that that isn't like a kind of that isn't like a moral vehicle but that is like treated as an as a totem as as an as an idolatry for for the real truth and and you know so it's, it it then promulgates a kind of mythology and an esoteric you know sort of endless fudging and excuse making and you know sort of uh scapegoating in order to to double down and preserve that structure but okay yeah so i think that the, the i think that it's not true that all borderlines are secondary psychopaths i think that it is something that they do develop though because I think that, I mean, you know, when a borderline accesses their subconscious because their main preferred tactic isn't working because they're not able to unilaterally dictate the narrative of the particular field circuit that they have established, uh, you know, the kind of the super ego, um, unconscious um, control over then what they do is when they access their subconscious, they could actually just use the subconscious just to kind of be feisty, be, be to foist on some new pressure, just to be a kind of malcontent or, or just to be chaotic, just to be, just to be, um, or just to air exasperation, just to air a kind of desperation in another valence, in another voice, in another, in another setting, in some sense, in, 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 from another angle of of trajectory of um, of pleading, of applying pressure. So it's just another vector to shake things up, but then essentially they can perhaps see narcissists operate and then the subconscious is free to sort of develop in that way or, or, or to sort of graft itself into that kind of implement 
So I think it, it's a, it, it, they are two independent loan strategies. And you could even have a borderline who has, instead of being a secondary psychopath, is secondarily actually a more sane human being. That, the, that you could catch the subconscious in a moment where it hasn't developed a kind of a, a calcified armor of bad faith and narcissistic machinery. Um, so the state of the subconscious, I think, I think perhaps when, when it develops a kind of secondary psychopathy, you have, you have a calcified collaboration of bad faith between both strategies that that is perhaps a kind of an immutable developmental stagnation that you can never necessarily, um, I don't like, you know, I think that trying to provide therapy to borderline personality disorder, I mean, how dialectical behavior therapy works is it works by essentially bootstrapping self-determinism and self-ownership. It says, do you want an effective treatment or do you want me to dole out some coping with your latest iteration of the drama? And so if the start of every exchange is predicated, well, we know that we're not giving you an effective treatment right now because we're dealing with some, some of the never-ending circulation of chimeric and chameleonic, you know, kind of iterations of chaos, you know, sort of um, moral terrorism or, or you know, uh, you know, the, the failures in your ability to decompartmentalize your, 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 your targets and your, um, you know, kind of uh, skirmishes and failed skirmishes and people who have uh, uh, fought against your style of um, social manipulation and usurpation um, and disintegration of morality into drama games and, you know, you feeling bad about seeing that other people got away with their social manipulation, that you can't get over your resentment over not being able so not being such a similarly successful social manipulator. That's, so you, you can deal with that in therapy with a borderline. And then, but you know that when you're dealing with that, you're not getting an effective treatment and the patient has to know that. And that's the that's the structure of dialectical behavior therapy is that they know when they're not getting an effective treatment so that the ball's in their court to say, okay, now I'm going to take responsibility. Now I should get some effective treatment. And then as soon as they start getting the effective treatment, then they push the escape hatch and then they go back to it. And then, and then you have some track record where you say, well, you see, every time we start having an effective treatment, you very quickly retreat. And so, you know, and so you have, at least within the, the truth of that particular dialogue, you have essentially the evidence of their own bad faith, as it were, mounting up against them, that they can't help but be confronted by it. Uh, now, this is, as soon as you have, I would say that, you know, that, um, as soon as the subconscious and uh, the unconscious and ego are, those are sort of two separable issues, are both invested in um, in the tactic um, of either the, the Oedipal mother narrative inception or the sort of the the corralling towards the Oedipal mother by the narcissistic terrorism of cutting other people's connections to their own um, uh, let's call it uh, emotional reasoning uh, or you know the the the, the, the fluid um, interconnection of pathways within metagram circuitry. That that you know, sort of clipping other people's wings, to force them to contend uh, with your 
spiraling vortex narrative and, and unilateral control over a field circuit. Anyway, um, yeah. So, so that when they have both of those tactics, I think um, uh, they they have uh, the analogy of that is you know, the, the kind of the, the thing that I spoke about in this recording earlier when I talked about the sociological plan and the semantic thing, because then they've got two separate valences, they've got two separate voices that can both confirm each other in their bad faith, and therefore they can kind of play a shell game between the two, and so you can kind of create a mirror trick of an infinite regress where you can always just shift the onus of proof on, on the other one and, and say, well, you know, it's semantic. Oh, it's, well, we need the solution because this is the only way out. And so we're desperate for the practical solution and this is the only one. And if you argue with that, then you have to take on my label. And if you don't accept my label, then we're not going to get to the solution that we need in, in practice. And so the, the narcissist and the Oedipal mother structure when they are both in this kind of bad faith they can create an infinite regress between themselves and this is also why they form such a strong social structure when you get cerebral histrionics and oedipal mother ideologies or borderlines um, and why they they facilitate each other so so much because they disguise each other's bad faith they disguise each other's moral ambiguity as it were and a nebulous you know kind of um fudge treatment of of things um and you know culture obviously is suffering because this whole you know you're sacrificing field circuits um into this abyss um into being controlled by some kind of moral code some kind of groupthink, some kind of narrative uh, that is like a mythology that just has to sort of be, is, is just an orthodox dogma that you just have to allow yourself to be inducted into. Like you have to believe this story, this blood and soil, or this, you know, sort of lived experience inherited down through the generations. And um, whatever form it takes, um, and so you don't have an independent iteration of these field circuits. You have them collectively owned by the, the social spirit of the time or something like that. And then you have these disgusting tone police people that are trying to sanctify this uh, destructive even demonic, I think, I think you could call it demonic, but um, obviously it doesn't help so much unless you get into the actual mechanics of it. Um, but I would say that, yeah, so narcissists are the way that they are because they are aware of the Oedipal mother, they've been, they've, been associated with it their whole life and so they depend on it already functioning but i think that the psychopathology even narcissism i think this is all grounded in the kind of in the oedipal mother i do think that it's a um the super ego unconsciousness sort of inception 
So, I mean, I, I, I mean, roughly, I think this can be equated to the Keegan stages where it's sort of like masculinity sort of tends to have problems integrating what I might call sort of Keegan stage 2.5 becomes a problem, a developmental obstacle. Whereas women at a very young age, girls at a very young age, are essentially confront, uh, sort of confronting sort of Keegan stage 3.5 already, that there's a kind of, there's, an, there's a nihilism that they have to kind of overcome so that they can properly develop their Keegan stage 2, their subconscious, and have that integrated with their unconscious. But they're too busy with their kind of Keegan stage one and Keegan, or what I would call Keegan stage one and Keegan stage three. They're super eager and their unconscious is kind of, um, and, and this is because I think women have a natural overarching tendency to, I mean, maybe it's a cultural thing as well, that, you know, to help the sexes be complementary to one another, that the one is more, has, is, has a higher degree of mastery between the subconscious, the unconscious, and the ego, and the other one has a mastery between the superego, the ego, and the unconscious. But these have different, on average different, they manifest different aggregations of developmental obstacle that the one the one's developmental obstacle is three point uh, you know keegan stage 3.5 nihilism and the other one is a kind of keegan stage 2.5 um so i'm just writing this out you know i'm, I'm slightly adapting the keegan stages uh fit my model but also i mean because i i i just trying to think of the arguments that I made that I described as the problem of Keegan stage 2.5 is um, is obviously the the portal into into the unconscious going from the subconscious to the unconscious and um, the problem there is you know is you have to kind of You have to learn to sort of build a Tower of Babel and then live in its shadow and in the shame that you built the Tower of Babel because that's sort of always what the unconscious is when it's not properly integrated and you do have to kind of go through the, the teething of it as it were. That if you don't sort of live in the shadow of, of the Tower of Babel then you you don't quite know how to deal with other people's sort of Keegan stage 3.5 but also there's a kind of there's a translation as well between Keegan stage 2 and Keegan stage 3 that has to happen that I'm not I'm not remembering my argument around that but um or, or my, my description around that of that developmental challenge but um and I'm too tired to continue to make these recordings I must stop babbling on now but uh I mean, I, 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 I'll probably make another recording that, that cleans this up, but um, oh, yeah, I've got other things that I need to do as well.